Fantastic. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, I've been asked by Rosie to speak today primarily on Hezbollah, um, couched into this rather ominous title of Danger and Destabilizing Forces as Threats for Democracy and Peace in the Middle East. Not my title, Rosie's title. Um, but I will focus on the report that we released last year on Hezbollah's role within the power structure in Lebanon. Just I assume you all know a little bit about Lebanon, so it's a sectarian power division between Christians, Muslims, and <coughs> Sunni, uh, Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, so each one of having a key position in power. The parliamentary mm. president is from one faction, uh, the president of the republic uh, is another faction, and the prime minister is to be a third faction. This is, of course, a, the only solution um, uh, to the uh, civil war in Lebanon. Um, to divide power very structurally rather than let the various factions sort out their political problems with armed struggle as they had done in the past. Um, however, within the Shiite bloc, which is about 30% of the population in Lebanon, the main and really the only player is Hezbollah. And therefore, I'm going to go through the main parts of our report and a couple of extra things um, that has happened since June 2022 when we published that report, looking at uh, Hezbollah's military and also terrorist capabilities, its social and ideological influence in Lebanon, um, the global criminal structure, which is an outgrowth of uh, the Iran sanctions episodes that we are seeing right now, Hezbollah's role as a proxy for the Islamic Republic in Iran, and then, of course, a couple of slides of uh, you know what could be done. Just very quickly to my organization, the Counter Extremism Project is a transatlantic organization. Um, we're having a, the main office in New York, where I uh, usually work 50% of my time working with the UN and various international organizations. And we have a satellite, large satellite office here in Berlin that I'm leading. And then we have people working for us in London, in Brussels, in Dublin, and in Washington, DC. We focus, as uh, you know, the, she already mentioned, on the whole panoply of uh, violence uh, uh, informed or motivated by ideology, so all the way from violent right-wing extremism to Islamist terrorism and everything that is in between. But we have three main areas in which we wor work. First, counter-terrorism financing, counter-extremism financing, so how are these entities actually financing themselves? and advising both on the government level here in Germany, but also at the EU and at the US government <coughs> on how better regulations could be structured. Secondly, we look at issues of online regulation. Um, how are these online tools misused? And there's going to be a very small part in my presentation on how Spola does this, both to propagate uh, by, by terrorist uh, individuals and groups, but also to organize and fundraise and how can better and effective uh, regulations be done in order to make sure that the companies who do have billions of dollars in profit actually do what every other industry is doing, making sure that their services doesn't, calm, uh, doesn't cause a lot of uh, societal uh, pain and uh, suffering, which they at the moment, in our uh, opinion, do not do efficiently. And the third one, we conceptually work on the reintegration and uh, rehabilitation of terrorist defenders, including foreign terrorist fighters that returned from Syria and Iraq. And we look very closely into questions of uh, collecting evidence, um, uh, witness uh, uh, use of witnesses in these trials, uh, reintegration programs, how is the cooperation between state organizations and security organizations and civil society in various countries are going. And on behalf of the US government, we work in Central Asia with civil society organizations, trying to make sure that the integration of terrorist offenders into society doesn't mean primarily them being in prison camps for the rest of their lives. Um, as I said, today, Hezbollah is the main issue of my presentation. And uh, I would like to start with the military capabilities. That's what everyone is always talking about. So in since the conflict in Syria has erupted in 2012 and Hezbollah's involvement in the conflict in Syria, really Hezbollah transformed from a militia whose primary military aim was harassment attacks towards Israel into an actual full-fledged uh, uh, military that is rivaling in many cases as far as the quality of training and weapons uh, is concerned, outmatching the Lebanese armed forces. Um, secondly, it has a very complex relationship with the Lebanese armed forces. The UN has been tasked um, with uh, asking the Lebanese armed forces to ensure 
that there are no weapons and ammunition and rockets in southern Lebanon, but as you all know, that really was not achieved. Um, there is, however, also the problem that if you strengthen the Lebanese armed forces, you may inadvertently strengthen the Hezbollah force. So these are Hezbollah um, uh, armed personal carriers, which are American model, and I can guarantee you the US military did not supply Hezbollah with the M13, um, but they did supply the Lebanese armed forces and the southern Lebanese army, the one that was uh, left behind once the Israeli withdrew in 2000 from Lebanon with these vehicles, and they ended up now in Hezbollah's, uh, in Hezbollah's possession. So there is a tension here of A, Hezbollah being the only security provider in southern Lebanon in the Beka Valley, uh, alongside the Lebanese armed forces, but Hezbollah has grown since the, its involvement in the Syrian conflict to a size and military uh, um, supply that is outmatching the actual Lebanese armed forces. So any attempt to actually de-arm Hezbollah is very likely going to lead to a civil war. This would not necessarily be a problem. You could simply establish Hezbollah as a other Lebanese force if Hezbollah's aim as far as Israel would not be uh, continuing. So Hezbollah cell, of course, are trying to continue uh, to target um, uh, Israel. At the moment, the main battlefield between Israel and Hezbollah is not northern Israel, but it's Syria, where the, uh, is, uh, Israeli airstrikes continuously target Hezbollah targets because they are co-located with Iranian military targets. Um, and at the same time, in the last couple of weeks, Hezbollah started to heat up again the southern border of Lebanon with A, a military maneuver where they invited the international press, which they usually never do, showcasing an actual war against Israel as a clear signal. And secondly, in the last couple of days, actually trying to cross the border and establish a cell uh, or a foothold beyond the, what's called the blue line, that's the recognized border between Israel, the UN recognized border between Israel and Lebanon. Um, therefore, in our assessment, um, apart from everything else that's going on in Israel right now, as you know, it's a, at the moment a very high tense situation, you know, primarily caused by the new Israeli government, but that could mean that we are looking forward to another round of regional um, tensions between Lebanon and Israel. Uh, in addition, of course, Hezbollah always has maintained a cell not only for fundraising criminal activities, I'll outline why this is so crucial for Hezbollah, but also uh, in case they ever need it or are asked by Iran to do this, uh, to actually support uh, Iranian attacks like the Burgas bus bombing here in 2012. That was clearly an Iranian operation, however, was actualized by Hezbollah fighters, Amnia in, in the 1990s, uh, and so forth. Therefore, we do have a cell structure also here in Europe in 2015. About five tons of ammonium nitrate were found in Cyprus. Just for those who don't remember, ammonium nitrate was that, what, uh, that uh, uh, chemical component that so efficiently flattened half of Beirut when it blew up uh, in the harbor a couple of years ago. So five tons of this, about the same amount that was blowing up in Lebanon, um, was found in Cyprus, found in Cyprus 2015 in a Hezbollah storage. Ammonium nitrate is a simple component that is actually quite a miracle as far as fertilizers are concerned, and it's a very, very key component of uh, international agricultural uh, um, um, work. However, it's also, if you uh, treat it in the way, um, the one main explosive component of every IED ever used in Africa or the Middle East, or for that matter, in Afghanistan. So it is actually a highly explosive substance if you take the nitrate and leave out the ammonium, which is a fairly simple chemical process to do. Therefore, in our uh, estimation, Hezbollah, of course, remains a latent terror threat also outside the region. Hezbollah is not, in a classical sense of Al-Qaeda, ISIL, hell-bent on a tar uh, targeting Western targets, but if it's in their interest, if the pressure on Hezbollah in Europe gets too much, or if the Iranian Revolutionary Guard ask them to do any kind of support operation, um, they will not hesitate to attack Europe as well. Hezbollah also has a multi-pronged system in which it actually influences social and ideological discussions inside Lebanon that goes beyond the actual size of either 
the Shia population in, in, in Lebanon or what Hezbollah as a group actually should have as ideological influence. And that is a multi-bronged system. First of all, um, very, very important. It built really a complete structure of a state within a state. There is an actual Hezbollah economy within the Lebanese economy, including with global connections. There are building companies, there are uh, um, uh, financial services companies that are not directly linked to Hezbollah, but actually owned by Hezbollah. The problem is that whatever Hezbollah's influence in the financial sector means, it means that the unintended uh, 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 consequences of any sanctions against uh, Hezbollah by anyone, whether it's the EU or the US, is that the unintended consequences, i.e., questions of financial inclusion in Lebanon, questions of access to the banking system or the economy in, in Lebanon will always be higher than if it would be um, without this state within the state structure. How important that is, you, uh, you may have remembered these uh, actual armed con uh, conflicts in 2012, if I remember correctly, when the Lebanese state decided to actually try to assert control over the Lebanese communication systems, which was a, its own telephone system that Le Hezbollah had established, and that led to armed, actually, fights within the streets of Beirut. That's how important that part, economic part, is for, um, for Hezbollah. Therefore, this first economic arm, really inside uh, 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 Lebanon, allows Hezbollah to outmatch any other faction or party or even the Lebanese state in southern Lebanon and the Beka Valley. The second prong of this one is, of course, education, which is crucial if you want to continue to build and maintain ideological support. There is a network of Al-Mahdi schools, which are private schools. <coughs> so 70% of all Lebanese children actually go to private schools. The Mahdi schools, which should normally not be a problem, however, including apart from the normal, this is the logo of the Mahdi school, this is a picture of one of them in the Beka Valley, there's about eight or nine of those, um, offer not only the normal curriculum, but also ideological lessons, including loyalty to Hezbollah ideology and loyalty to the supreme leader in Iran, which is not necessarily what you want to have in a school system of a state like Lebanon. Also, there is the uh, Imam Al-Mahdi Scout Foundation or Association, which is a scout foundation, two arms, one for boys, one for girls. Here, too, they do everything else that a scout association would do, outdoor activities, teaching about the environment, um, campsites, but they also include military training. So here you can see um, two of the Mahdi scouts with one of the Hezbollah fighters who later became a suicide bomber in Syria, and of course the kids have arms. The third prong is uh, anything to do with charitable organizations in southern Lebanon, uh, including hospitals. These, of course, um, not only replace state services and the prolonged political crisis in Lebanon and the prolonged economic crisis in Lebanon meant that this is the only service that is available in southern Lebanon at this point. Um, it uses, however, also, and this would be fine if this would be Hezbollah money, but it actually, because Hezbollah has been in the government consistently for a number of years already, uh, state funds are diverted to fund this very same system that is replacing the state system. And therefore, again, any sanctions on Hezbollah means there is a large-scale unintended consequences if you sanction Hezbollah financial flows, you essentially also sanction the state, uh, the, the only provider of health services in the Beka Valley. And so in some cases, and this is quite a, um, a weird case, uh, it's called Green Without Borders, which is on the face of it an actual NGO that cares about planting trees in Lebanon, which is not a bad thing. But it turned out that it's actually a network of Hezbollah listening stations towards southern Lebanon that was disguised as the offices of that actually quite unproblematic Lebanese charity. And therefore, um, abroad, quasi-charitable organizations that Hezbollah has set up, like Weisenkinder Lebanon, FV, uh, were actually used to fund the military operations of Hezbollah, because the Weisenkinder that that Weisenkinder Lebanon FV was talking about was the Weisenkinder of suicide bombers and killed Hezbollah fighters. 
The fourth prong of this network is, of course, Hezbollah's media network. And here, Hezbollah has been able to build up anything you would expect from a state government network in parallel to the Lebanese network. So it has TV stations, radio stations, um, print media, and it has a large-scale media presence, both on Facebook as well as YouTube and Twitter. Um, the social media presence is very much used to fund Hezbollah, and you can see one of these funding drives, and uh, you can see the military fatigue, so the funding drive was not actually used to fund any charitable organizations, but quite openly via Facebook funding the military operations of Hezbollah, which, again, let me point out, this is not the Lebanese armed forces. This is a non-state actor within the Lebanese political system. Here, with the Digital Services Act and the Terrorist Content Online Directive that the EU passed, hopefully, at least for within the EU, there will be a possibility to put a stop to the military funding activities that are ongoing on Facebook as we speak. Third one, um, you could say, okay, this is all fine, and they're part of the government, so they're legitimate actor, but they're not a responsible legitimate actor, because as you know, since the end of last year, his, uh, Lebanon is for the first time in a position where it has neither an elected president, nor does it have an actual cabinet. All of those cabinet members who are in power are in a caretaker position, which means you can't pass new laws, you can't change regulations. And just last week, his ball operated for the 12th time the election of a new Lebanese president. So they are not acting responsibly inside the Lebanese system. They're acting primarily and only in their political interest within Lebanon, i.e. access to state funds, power over the government. At one point, they had a veto power over anything that the political government in uh, the government in Lebanon would do with only having 30% of the population. This is not how the system is intended to work, right? Um, then finally, and this is something that is more recent um, and an outgrowth of the sanctions against Iran, um, Hezbollah is also a global criminal structure. Um, since 2012, when the sanctions were first ramped up by the EU and then the US, or both in the same time, against Iran, <coughs> funding for Hezbollah from Iran is, of course, still ongoing, but it was a clear message that part of the income that Hezbollah needs to spend on its army, on its social arm, on its political arm, on its media network, needs to be generated by Hezbollah itself. And that meant, of course, they tried to increase the economic activities in um, uh, Lebanon, but very quickly understood that if you only operate within the economic structure in Lebanon, you will not be able to generate the amount of funds that you would need to sustain your network. And they were very much uh, pushed into the global drug distribution and money laundering system. So here the drug flows from South America uh, to Europe, in primarily cocaine and hashish in this case. And as you can see, the one key aspect here, and the colleague just told me that there is, oh, sorry, there is a somewhere, there is, uh, oops, not sure what happened. Uh, there's supposed to be, can you tell me again which button I need to press for the, for the uh, middle one? For the, ah, ah yeah, I found it now. Perfect. Sorry for that one. My, I should have paid more attention when you explained the clicker to me. Um, as you can see, the main thoroughfare of the actual drug flows from South America goes through West Africa. And that's where there is a large Lebanese community that in part Hezbollah has co-opted to actually do the drug transportation. This will become uh, quite important, uh, that particular area here in a minute, why this is uh, so problematic. So the drugs flow from South America to West Africa. There's a secondary flow. I mean, you always hear about drug busts in Rotterdam Harbor or in Bremerhaven, but this is the secondary flow. The actual large amounts, and we're talking about hundreds of tons of cocaine and hashish, flow through West Africa. Money gets laundered here by Hezbollah. Secondly, Hezbollah has developed its uh, global money laundering network in such a way that they're actually now offering money laundering. This is just one of the money laundering scheme, schemes that uh, is now adjudicated in a US court. You can see how you know, global this uh, flow of money is, including in Australia. Um, so much so ramped up their money laundering network that they actually opened a side business. And there are two Lebanese uh, who were in court in 2015 who were arrested after they tried to offer money laundering service of the tune of 100 million US dollars 
to what they thought was the American mafia in Chicago when it was actually to DEA agents in a sting operation. Um, the deal was that they would launder money and then the Americans could choose whether they want freshly printed US dollars or used US dollars. They could designate the denomination. Do you want $20 bills, $100 bills, $50 bills for the funds that we are laundering for you? And uh, the amount discussed was $100 million, four or five percent fee. So Hezbollah would launder the money for the American mafia and would take a five uh, percent uh, fee for doing so. So that means you have a massive criminal operation because drugs is a highly profitable commodity um, that can supplant then some of the money that is no longer quite as forthcoming from uh, Iran. Now you can say, okay, fine, uh, this is the way it is. Everyone always takes drugs. But the problem with West Africa is that this is the picture of control in West Africa. Anything in red means it's out of control of government, which means most of Mali, most of Burkina Faso, and increasing parts of Nigeria are outside of government control and are controlled by real actual global terrorist organizations. Yeah? So the Islamic State uh, Greater Sahara Province, the Islamic State West Africa Province, and the Al-Qaeda coalition, Jinim. And the drugs flow exactly from this point through those Al-Qaeda Jinim territories towards the north, and obviously, Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State are not letting those drugs flow through their territory with it without taking their cut, which means the, the Hezbollah drug operations here in the south and the flow of the drugs north. Inadvertently, this is not the aim of Hezbollah, it's just the way of the cost of business in that region, actually finances Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State, which also means yeah, we have an increasingly weak governance structure because on top of all the terrorist problems, we do have a massive transnational crimes problem. And my, my organization is at the moment working with the German government on a new strategy paper on how to get these multiple problems of weak governance, terrorist operations, transnational organized crime networks, intercommunal violence between urban and uh, nomadic tribes in the north of these countries, plus the increasing effects of climate change and the massive increase of refugee flows towards the north, somewhat in, uh, better in, uh, under control. The regional answer of the governments in Mali and Burkina Faso is basically to call in the Wagner Group, um, which his primary purpose is to conduct massacres, is essentially. Um, this is a survival strategy of the governments. This is not a strategy to contain terrorism or to regain control over their territory, but simply to, uh, to ensure the physical survival of the government members of these very uh, various governments in Burkina Faso and in Mali that came to power via military coups. So this is not the solution to the problem. It just adds another layer of problems to the problem. And to top it all off, we have an increasing problem at the size about at this time of the piracy problem that we had in Somalia a couple of years ago here in the Gulf of Guinea. Luckily, the Gulf of Guinea is not quite as significant for global flows as the uh, Somali coastline was, at the, or is at this time, at the out, uh, uh, at the out uh, flow of the uh, uh, Red Sea and the Suez Canal, but it is a growing problem of piracy. So we have drugs coming in, we have pirates operating here, we have transnational organized crime networks, primarily also organized by Hezbollah operating here, we have Al-Qaeda and the Islamic operate, uh, state operate here, and then we wonder why we have 300% more refugees in Tunis. Who would want to live in this region? Um, and Hezbollah is exacerbating the situation with its drug and money laundering operations in that region. That's why it is a growing problem. Secondly, um, Iran and, Israel, uh, and uh, Hezbollah conjointly um, are trying to test out how they can misuse new technologies, Hezbollah to finance itself, Iran to evade sanctions called cryptocurrencies. I'm not sure if you know, but Iran is one, I just wrote here one, but it's actually the most active country in crypto mining, so much so that two years ago in summer there were electricity shortages in Tehran, the capital of Iran, because all of the electricity was actually diverted to crypto mining in the country. Um, neither Iran nor Lebanon regulate cryptocurrencies. So as you can see from, or maybe you're not too, if you're too far back, but um, both countries are in white, which means they're not 
regulating cryptocurrencies at all for good reason, because if you want to use that for terrorism financing or money laundering or sanctions evasion, the last thing you want to do is actually regulate this whole thing. And despite the uh, repeated assurances from the industry, right, crypto misuse in Hezbollah in Lebanon is not a common factor. That was just 12 months ago. Unfortunately, last week, $1.7 million in cryptocurrencies had been recovered by uh, Israel in cooperation with the industry from Hezbollah. Of course, they moved away from Bitcoin, the most transparent and most traceable um, uh, uh, cryptocurrency, to Tether, which is a non-transparent cryptocurrency which actually encrypts the wallets. So obviously, it's still going on. The relationship in Iran, of course, as a proxy role, is not only multifaceted, so there's an ideological and military in, in, uh, uh, cooperation, there's intelligence cooperation, there's economic, economic cooperation, and, of course, there is criminal cooperation as far as money laundering is concerned. This is particularly problematic when it comes to the intel structure because here we have a shift in the Iranian intelligence community in the last six years. So until about 2000. Uh, 18, the IRGC, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard intelligence structure, was primarily geared towards internal intelligence of the IRGC itself. So pretty much what the Militärische Abschirmdienst, MAD, does in Germany, ensuring that there are no traitors or spies within the IRGC. Since that time, however, the IRGC intelligence organization has been upgraded to an actual official intelligence organization, which means it's now in parallel to the Ministry of Intelligence of Iran at the same organizational level, uh, which means you now have two parallel operating intelligence services, which also means the IRGC, thereby, by extension, Hezbollah has access to anything the Iranian intelligence organization or the intelligence community in Iran gets as intelligence, which means, of course, there is an absolute jump in the ability of Hezbollah to predict any moves against the organization any move against its arms. Therefore, uh, Hezbollah also now is a much stronger instrument of Iranian foreign policy because it's much more, because it's led the relationship with Hezbollah, I forgot to mention. Um, not the Iranian Republic has a relationship with Hezbollah. The IRGC has a, a relationship with Hezbollah. Within the Iranian regime, there are a division of labor. And the army, the intelligence forces, are acting like an army and intelligence force would do of any other state. The whole issue about the regional role of, his, of uh, Iran and its relationship with proxy organizations, the Houthis, the Hezbollah, Bahraini cells, and you know, uh, uh, cells here in Germany, is exclusively done by the IRGC. So I should have more correctly formulated that Hezbollah is an instrument of the IRGC foreign policy, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard foreign policy in Iran. That means it is operating where the IRGC needs help in Syria, in Iraq, in Bahrain, as well as in Yemen. And therefore, it's really increasingly difficult to distinguish when you're talking about foreign operations, where is actually the IRGC component ending and the Hezbollah component, component beginning, or who gets instructions from whom? Is Hezbollah operating on a broad Iranian instruction to do something, or are these uh, Hezbollah fighters essentially operating on very specific uh, instructions from Tehran or the Islamic Revolutionary Guard? The outcome of what Hezbollah has done has been quite on behalf of Iran. None of these attacks had anything to do with Hezbollah interests. So the Mykonos attacks killed here in Berlin in 1992 a couple of Kurdish dissidents of Iranian origin did nothing for Hezbollah, but half of the attack team was actually Hezbollah fighters. The Amia bombing against uh, Israeli and Jewish uh, institutions in uh, South America had nothing to do with furthering uh, uh, Hezbollah interest. It was furthering Iran's or the IGC's interest. The Burgas bus bombing in 2012, a one of the responses <coughs> that Iran had done to some sabotage operations within its country by Israel, killed Israeli tourists, had nothing to do with furthering Hezbollah interests, but were done on behalf of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Therefore, unfortunately, if you do have a sympathizer structure in the country, including in Germany, this is increasingly becoming a major concern because Iran, being under pressure at the moment, 
could at any time decide that they need some operations and don't need to use their own network, which means they would have no plausible deniability, but simply can ask Hezbollah to do this. So what could be done? This is a quick SWOT analysis that I did on the strengths and weaknesses of uh, Hezbollah, what are the threats to Hezbollah, what are the opportunities for Hezbollah, right? So the strengths are, of course, that it has fighting experience over many decades right now, and the involvement in external conflict in Syria, which upgraded it really to a military operation. It has an external support and maintains a relationship with Iran, including in particular the IRGC, and it has established a very global, multi-pronged and overlapping financial network, which means funding of Hezbollah will remain very strong. It's very centralized, so it goes all to the Central Committee and they get distributed out. But the generation of funds is multi-pronged on donations, on economic ac activities, as well as criminal activities. So trying to get to grips with Hezbollah finances would require a large-scale effort. The weaknesses of Hezbollah is that the economic conditions in Lebanon are beyond dire for quite a long time at the moment. And it's very clear that if you are the pro strongest individual political player in Lebanon, that you bear some uh, 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 responsibility for this. The other weakness is that, of course, as Iran gets economically under pressure, so will its support for the money flows from Tehran to Hezbollah be under pressure. And um, there is a growing body of targeted bilateral sanctions, both against Iran as well as Hezbollah. The other weakness, of course, is its involvement in criminal organizations and criminal operations, because that doesn't require a fight against Hezbollah on any counterterrorism grounds, but simply on criminal grounds. So if you money launder, it doesn't matter whether you do it for Hezbollah. If you transport drugs, it doesn't matter. If you do it for ideological reason, you're transporting drugs, which means you have a whole body of criminal law internationally that can be brought to bear. That means the threat is not just Israeli military operation, but it's also internal Lebanese discontent and more effective global law enforcement cooperation that could cut these uh, um, uh, quite significant funding streams out of the international drug trade that Hezbollah has developed. The opportunities, of course, for Hezbollah is they remain the strongest player, individual player in Lebanon. They are the kingmaker in any political uh, uh, um, system, in any political solution that is now to, uh, found to the uh, governance problems in uh, um, um, uh, Lebanon. There is a Gulf realignment, the way from pressure on Iran to a more cooperative attitude towards Iran, which also would mean that then pressure from the Gulf states, as far as funding for Hezbollah is concerned, will, uh, uh, will get weaker. And of course, there is a lack of transparency, both in the regional as well in general in the global financial system, which means those financial flows that are absolutely necessary for Hezbollah to operate are very hard to detect. Countering, therefore, uh, Lebanon's role within Lebanon uh, from the outside is really extremely difficult and is hardly really advisable. So any external influence on the role inside Lebanon um, will have massive unintended consequences. It's really hard to target sanctions when you have a Hezbollah financial system, when you have a Hezbollah medical and uh, uh, social support system that is simply not in parallel to the state support, but the only support that uh, people receive in Lebanon. So sanctions, if they are used, need to be very, very specifically targeted, and you should be always aware of the massive amount of unintended consequences that sanctions mean in this regard, right? However, the Hezbollah's dominance over the information space, that's something you can influence from the outside, right? So there should be more emphasis on Hezbollah's disruptive role in Lebanon, in the Lebanese political and economic system. There is a massive corruption problem in the economic system in, in Lebanon, but partially that corruption is caused by Hezbollah trying to pay off everyone who is in opposition to it, and if they're not paid off, they die. Um, secondly, Hezbollah's deference to Iran's priorities. So not only its involvement in Syria really doesn't do anything for Hezbollah's role in Lebanon or its ideology. I mean, they're supporting a laicist uh, Assad regime um, who has conducted more than its share of international criminal offenses and wars against humanity. But also, it really doesn't enhance the security of Lebanon for Hezbollah to be in Syria. That could be highlighted. All of those terror operations that Hezbollah was involved in the past really had nothing to do 
with Hezbollah's role or aims inside Lebanon. It was simply an expression of its role and uh, its deference to Iranian interests. That should be further clarified within the information space in Lebanon. And this could be done with a good counter-narrative campaign. Disrupting global support structure of, of uh, uh, Hezbollah, however, is something that should and could be much easier done. Right? So Hezbollah struck in money laundering networks directly affect Europe. The cocaine that is co consumed today in Berlin will have flown through West Africa. Uh, it will have uh, uh, financed Al Qaeda and the Islamic State in that region. Right? That means increased law enforcement and intelligence cooperation could actually disrupt that particular part. Hezbollah networks in Europe are, of course, a major concern, and we need to continue to focus on the supporter and sympathizer networks. There were a couple of raids when Hezbollah, as an organization itself, in total, was declared a criminal group, uh, a terrorist group in April 2020, but there haven't been any follow up. Is the really assumption that one raid will do this, that people will stop fundraising for Hezbollah once you raided their offices once? Will they not establish uh, any follow up organizations? Will they not try to fundraise via a different name? Why has there been not a follow up raid? And who actually got convicted out of these raids? And secondly, Hezbollah's involvement, or finally, Hezbollah's involvement in West Africa is now a key counterterrorism issue. This, in an inverted comma, is not the fault for Hezbollah. They didn't ask for Al Qaeda in the Islamic State to take over large parts of Burkina Faso and Mali, but this is where we are, which means Hezbollah operations, which are unhindered, interestingly, by both Al Qaeda and the Islamic State, because they also earn money on the drugs that are flowing through the regions, right, is now really funding global terror organizations who are not deferring to Iran if they, Iran asks them to attack Europe, but whose sole aim is to attack Europe. Ha therefore, we need to make sure that we get a grip on what's going on in West Africa faster, and the decision of the government to withdraw from Mali, and now more recently the decision of the UN to withdraw its UN operations in Mali, is really a step in the totally wrong direction because it will increase the migration flow northwards. And to uh, assume that we can have a similar deal with Tunisia that we have with Turkey in basically ensuring the migrants stay in the country rather than actually go where they wanted to go um, is really not a sustainable solution. All right, that is my quick overview of Hezbollah's role in our report that we released. And I'm very much for looking forward to your questions. Thank you, yeah. <laughs> so I actually have three questions, and one is going to be devil's advocate. Okay. Um, so number one would be, recently you saw, uh, like you were talking about July 23, 23 they were attacking Syria. Um, I don't know if you're all aware, also northern Syria, Russia and Syria has attacked. And this was like in Idlib, the last terrorist stronghold. And they were pressing to Turkey. And it was not like, I didn't see it, like it was not visible on the news or anything. I actually talked to, um, to Der Spiegel and I also talked to a friend who was at the border who was listening to the bombs. And he called me, was like, you know that Idlib is being bombed really hard. Um, so I wonder um, about what you make out of the situation that um, Russia and, Syria, uh, and Syria, the Syrian government are together pushing out terrorists um, who are probably going to go to Turkey if this is um, the Moscow way uh, to threaten, threaten the West by doing this. And um, number two would be we saw um, all those African countries that already have trouble with, um, with uh, keeping their territory peacefully. And um, given climate change, resource, uh, like resource conflict and so on, I am afraid that it's only going to get worse. I am not seeing any alleviation, so I would be interested if, um, if like, given the growing, um, like, yeah, the growing effects of climate change and so on, if you see any hope for this being improved. So, and now my devil's advocate question: Are you watching the CIA too? Because the CIA openly said that for the last 40, 50 years they are funding extremist groups, they are funding right-wing groups. 
and they openly, you can actually find it on the CIA page, um, they openly talk about all over the world where they were fighting um, leftist governments and making coups and mainly really supporting right wing and extremist groups. So um, under the extremist, group, extremist group's umbrella, I kind of think the CIA should be also be observed closely. And if not somebody in Germany does it, who would do it then? Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, you want to go for those three questions first or should I collect more? Well, let's go to the three and then okay. we'll do another three then afterwards. Um, so first of all, Idlib. Um, Idlib is indeed um, controlled by a group called Hayat Tahir al-Sham, which previously was called the Anusra Front, which previously was called Al-Qaeda in Syria. Um, obviously, uh, HTS has great, taken great pains to portray itself as a more I think the model is the Taliban in Syria. This is what uh, its leader had said is the model of what HDS wants to be. Um, thinking that this would be in any way uh, making people more relaxed about engaging HDS, but um, it's the only opposition apart from the Kurdish area, other opposition territory that as the Assad regime has not taken back. My fear is with the growing reintegration of the Assad regime, into the Arab fold, so they've been invited to the GCC conference, they invited back to the Arab League. Um, um, people will stop caring about Idlib. So Idlib being run by HTS is not the solution, but Idlib run by the Assad regime is definitely not the solution. <coughs> so I, I fear that the, the time of opposition uh, uh, held territory in Idlib will slowly come to an end. The Syrians will have to clean out uh, any last remaining serious opposition um, because they do have a problem now internally, not only with the war in Ukraine, but also with the Wagner Group. And when we're talking about Russia in Syria, we're talking about the Wagner Group in Syria. It's not the Russian army who operates there. So yes, unfortunately, I don't see any uh, positive developments as far as Idlib is concerned. And then once Idlib is gone, Idlib is gone then really the question of the Kurdish territory arises. And that opens a completely different can of worms because, as you all know, the Kurdish uh, 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 autonomy government has done us the massive and really undeserved favor of taking care of our foreign terrorist fighters that they had arrested from the Islamic State ever since. And so far, while Germany has repatriated women and children from the, can, uh, from the camps, um, it has not rep repatriated any men. Um, uh, of German origin or connections to Germany who had left Germany uh, in between 2014 and 2017 uh, uh, to join the Islamic State. So all the men are still there. We're talking anywhere on the op optimistic front, i.e. the names that we definitely know is 30. The names that we suspect are still there are 300. Um, and these are in various Syrian prisons. And more tragically, um, there is a tendency of the Kurdish authorities to count boys that have turned 18 to actually the male population of ISIL and then transfer them from detainment camps into the prison system, which definitely is going to absolutely ensure their further radicalization. So once the Kurdish areas will be under pressure either by Assad or by Turkey or by Russia or by Iran or all of the above in the future, this is an untenable security situation. That's why we've been asking every country to take back their foreign terrorist fighters so at least the Kurds are not stuck with them when they have better things to do. Secondly, Africa. The problem is not just climate change. The problem, if I go back to my map, uh, the colleague said, you will, you will need your, uh, the laser pointer, and he was absolutely right. Um, so if you go back to the map, the problem with decolonization and the drawing of borders, which were not the natural borders, um, of these states in the 50s and 60s was that you have a band of nomadic peoples here in the north and a band of urbanized uh, population down here, the urbanized population being primarily African, the nomadic population being primarily Af uh, Arab origin. Every single country, depending on where the capital is in the north and the south, um, in this area has the same problem. The South doesn't care about the North, the North doesn't care about the South. Now, in Burkina Faso and Mali, the problem was that the urbanized capitals never developed the nomadic uh, North. And that's exactly where you see the, the big red blots. It's not that the terrorism problem arose 
of course, to a certain extent, you know, educational systems provided by Pakistan and uh, South, uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in the 60s, 70s, and 80s did play a role in shaping Islam in these areas. But the underlying problem is, is that these areas have, since the decolonization, not been developed by their own governments. And successive governments, including many, many coup governments, never developed in the faintest of interest in developing economically, socially, education-wise, the north of their own countries. Now, if you are Fulani, which is the biggest tribal confedera uh, nomadic confederation here in the north, and the only interaction with the Burkina Kabe, Kabe or the Malian state is a checkpoint of security forces where you have a 50-50 chance of either being arrested or killed, you have a 2014 situation that we had in Mosul where the state is perceived the bigger enemy and the terrorist organization, you know, whether it's the Islamic State or Al-Qaeda, is considered the safer option by this local population. So the problem is not primarily caused and not resolved by a potential, although this is not even on the cards right now, looking at the extent of these, these territories, a defeat or weakening of Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State, because that means only these uh, uh, nomadic uh, uh, people will have to think of other ways to protect themselves, because they're not getting protection or development from their own governments at this point. Therefore, the best that can be hoped is to hopefully increase cooperation with what is still yellow here, i.e., actual halfway functioning states all having their own problems, all having their uh, rather shady human rights records, but at least there is some kind of semblance of governments in these states to make sure that these Al-Qaeda operators don't get access to the harbor, link up with the piracy problem here and the drug flows that come directly at the coast, i.e. increasing their ability to uh, uh, gain money uh, another tenfold. Uh, cooperate with the northern states, so that's Algeria, hopefully try to find a political so uh, solution for Libya, which still supplies the majority of arms and ammunitions that are used down here in a flourishing illicit economy on, uh, to both sides of the borders to contain, at least for the time being, the problem because neither Mali nor Burkina Faso at the moment wants any help outside Wagner. It has asked the French forces to leave. It is now asking for the UN forces to leave. Um, and the only way that this is going to get any better is if those governments actually try to accept help again. On top of this, we have a growing desertification here up in the north, which means rather than no government investment, you would have to have massive government investment to ensure that there is enough access to water. So CIA funding. No, we are not looking at state institutions. So I'm talking about Hezbollah. I'm not talking about the Lebanese army in my presentation. Um, and I would, would hesitate to say that what you refer to, what the CIA does, is a thing of the 60s and 70s. They haven't done that in a while, right? So <laughs> I have not seen any state courts that weren't, weren't Russian-sponsored in a long time. So uh, in a way, no, we're not looking at the CIA. All right. Well, that's a really difficult question. I would right? say that was CIA sponsored. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm quite sure it wasn't, but you know. anyway, anyway, we don't know yet. We will that see in be, 10, 20 years to, when they to we first can have sponsor a bet. him and then put him under sanctions would be a right red strategy. We can have a bet, <laughs> and in 10 years they will declassify it, and we will know. Um, but yeah, uh, do have a look at the CIA websites because it's very, very interesting how they funded extremism all over the world. And they're open about it, yeah. very open, so it's well, not conspiracy what I'm telling. You should actually welcome telling. them being open about it. At least they confess to this. It, it feels shameless, though. After 15 years. Yeah, it feels shameless, and there's still some that aren't uh, declassified. Um, so I saw somebody, so I'm going to run up to you. <laughs> So uh, thank you for honestly answering the questions. Of I kind of, I kind of feel um, this is uneven, though, that we never look at state-sponsored terrorism. Only Iran, what terrorism Iran sponsored, but we're not looking what terrorism the U.S. sponsored. <laughs> As a global citizen, this is very disappointing to me. Yeah, but on the other hand, I would rather live under American rule than an Iranian rule. I lived six years in Iran, so I'm actually know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> it's not fun to live in the Islamic Republic, yeah, to say the least. Fun. <laughs> 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 <laugh
hello sir thank you uh, for the presentation uh, i am sher mashwani from afghanistan my question is from where does the terrorist comes and do they come from their own country like they are not fully satisfied by their own government they fight for their rights against them or there is external uh, evaluation in the country who sponsor them thank you in lebanon this is very clear so hispola is has been founded by the islamic uh, revolutionary guard corps it used to be called several different names and it amalgamated then under the actual management and leadership of the islamic revolutionary guard corps in the 80s into hispola so there is very clear um, that this is there was an indigenous ex expression of uh, shiite resistance against israel but it was hispola as particular as an organization as hispola had been managed and organized uh, and helped by this in its generation by the islamic revolutionary guard corps that's why hispola is very the iranian relationship with hispola is very different from the iranian relationship with any other of its proxy organizations so while for example um hispola gets what hispola needs if it needs that right including in 2006 where i was in iran and i know that the islamic republic leadership was not happy about this rather useless war against israel um hispola got everything that it needed after the war to rebuild southern lebanon very famously ahmadinejad made a trip and on that trip uh, uh, spent 600 million us dollars for the reconstruction of southern lebanon the same is not true for the houthis so yes of course the iranian revolutionary guard corps is supplying the houthis with material but it's only supplying the houthis with sufficient amount of material and the kind of material that they need not to lose not not to win so the idea of the iranians was not to make the houthis win in lebanon uh, in yemen but to draw out the conflict as long as possible because uh, you know is uh, saudi arabia making a key strategic mistake in thinking that they can defeat the houthis when president saleh tried in eight wars and failed to defeat the houthis was a perfect present to the islamic republic in drawing out military financial and political resources of saudi arabia into an unwinnable war in yemen so rather than supplying air defense mechanisms that would have been able to shoot down a lot of the fighter jets that the saudis and the uae used in yemen they supplied just enough that some were shot down they supplied just enough that uh, the uh, uh, coalition couldn't win the war but it never supplied which it could have done at any point supplied enough for the houthis to actually win that is very different from its relationship with hispola the same thing with bahrain of course the islamic revolutionary guard corps could very quickly transform bahrain into a terrorist hellhole if it chose to do so the majority of the population of that country is shia it's ruled over and controlled by a very tiny 10% sunni minority majority who absolutely discriminates against shias in bahrain so there is enough pent up danger to really destabilize that country but that's not the point the point is to keep bahrain under pressure and therefore those cells get sometimes some weapons sometimes they don't sometimes they get some material and support sometimes they don't this is very different from the relationship with hispola because iran actually organized hispola it's really the extension of the islamic revolutionary guard corps in the region as far as afghanistan is concerned that is i think the story is quite well known i would say so afghanistan did attract a lot of foreign terrorist fighters um outside from the region until about 2001 since that time if we're talking about foreign terrorist fighters we primarily talking about the relationship between the taliban and a whole range of al qaeda linked pakistani groups from lashkar e taiba to jamat uh, jamat muhammad to the terror e taliban pakistan so the vast majority of foreigners at the moment operating in afghanistan under the protection of the taliban are actually pakistani nationals in part attacking pakistan that's why the celebrations in islamabad after the taliban take over very quickly turned into a quite aggressive stance against uh, the taliban in addition Uh, the strategic interests of pakistan in afghanistan were never to make a particular faction win but to keep a certain amount and there is an actual master thesis of uh, nawaz sharif um uh, that is publicly available where he lays out 
the overall strategic aims of Pakistan in the region. And for Afghanistan, it's managed chaos. Pakistan is a strategic depth for the Pakistani state, which means they, because of their much larger, economically most prosperous uh, Indian neighbor, with which they are connected to in an unending, uh, unending enmity, the strategic depth of Afghanistan means the Pakistani government and military establishment needs to be able to manipulate whatever goes on in Afghanistan at a moment's notice. And that is not possible if you have a group like the Taliban exerting control all over the country. So if you had looked at the Pakistani support for the Taliban prior to 2001 and between 2001 and 2021, it went up and down with the amount of control that the Taliban had. When the Taliban were down, the control was, uh, the uh, support was achieved. When the Taliban were up, the support was very much reduced. So once the months Mother -e Sharif fell uh, in the late 1990s, the Pakistani support actually went down because the point is not to have the Taliban in Afghanistan. The point is to have managed chaos. And if the Taliban are the chaos provider, then the Taliban get support. And if the Taliban are actually the stability provider, the Taliban are much, much more critically viewed in Islamabad, as you can clearly see from the statements in the last 12 months from the Pakistani government, which sound very much like our position was towards the Taliban until August 2021. I do have a follow-up question, and I'm going to grant it to him. Thank you, sir. The question was about the terrorist group as you went in depth uh, uh, to the history of Afghanistan. Back in 2001, America came to Afghanistan for Osama bin Laden. And he is an Arab. Everybody knows him. And America, instead targeting Afghanistan, they could ask Saudi Arabia to give us Osama bin Laden. But they didn't do that. Before that, the Soviet Union war, America funded the Pakistani military and trained the Mujahideen group in Afghanistan. And that project was implemented by Pakistan. For the last 20 years, they, they gave money to Pakistan and trained the, the, the Taliban group. The American uh, foreign minister has admitted that the Taliban came to Afghanistan by the deal of America. They have agreed to that. So if they are fighting against the human rights and want a, uh, an Afghanistan full of peace and stability, why, why they supported the Taliban group for the last 30 years? Hmm. Right, so first of all, on Osama bin Laden. Um, of course, you could have asked the Saudi government in 2001 to deliver Osama bin Laden. The problem is he wasn't in Saudi Arabia, he was in Afghanistan. He was protected by the Taliban. Secondly, the discussion with the Taliban to get Osama bin Laden didn't start in 2001, it started in 1989, right? Uh, 98, where the first bombing um, of the embassies occurred in East Africa. And since that time, so three years, in which you had not only the, the two embassies blowing up, you had a warship being attacked in uh, Aden, the USS Cole. You had an attempt on uh, the LAX, the uh, uh, Los Angeles airport, which was only prevented by luck. And then you had 9-11. So the question was, if for three years the Taliban were not willing to give up Osama bin Laden, and you tried, you offered, you did your best to get him, how many more terror attacks would you like to have before you move, right? So. Being this being the largest terror attack in history, um, there was really no other option but to say you had three years to extradite one man to the international community. You had been asked by the Security Council, not the Americans, to extradite that man, that one man. They didn't ask about everyone else, they asked about just Osama bin Laden. Now, if the survival of Osama bin Laden and his continued efforts to attack the West are so important to you, then we do have a problem with you right now. They had another chance for three weeks to extradite him after the attack before, uh, and I'm, I was involved on the German government side in the planning here, so I know what I'm talking about. They had another chance to extradite him, and they refused. So sooner or later, there is really no other option. You've been asked, you've been offered, You've been asked again, you've been offered more stuff, and you don't, while there is a continuing campaign ongoing. And then when we 
actually captured the camps in Afghanistan, and I was in Afghanistan at the time, there was documentation that many more different attacks were in the planning stage. So we did the right thing by stopping this. I absolutely agree with you that in the end, there was a negotiation between, quite obviously, the Taliban and the US government. However, that negotiation was done in order to make sure that there is a peaceful transition. There were many mistakes that the, Af uh, the American government has done, most of which I would say the Trump administration trusting the Taliban would agree, uh, would agree to any kind of power sharing agreement. It was very clear that the Taliban were not up for a power sharing agreement, they were up for power in Afghanistan. That's why me, my organization has been very critical of our withdrawal, which was not done because there was any military or economic necessity for us to withdraw from Afghanistan was simply done because we ran out of political capital, um, very different to our engagement in Kosovo, because we had couched our engagement in Afghanistan primarily and most exclusively in counterterrorism terms, which means there's a win-lose proposition. The counterterrorism operation in earnest, i.e. the destruction of the Al-Qaeda infrastructure, however, was finished by about October 2002. From that time onwards, the ISAF, the German government, the US government has simply been, should have been more open and honest with their own publics and saying, we are now here for a stabilization organization, uh, operation. If you assume you can transform a country that has experienced 30 years of war internal strife where weapons are awash, which has difficult neighbors, both on the Iranian as well as the Pakistani side of the border, into a stable economic and democratic system within 10 years, you're sadly mistaken. We are here for at least three generations, as we are in Kosovo, as, as we are in Kosovo, as we are in other regions where we do stabilization operations. However, and that was the key mistake, we continue to argue on counterterrorism terms, right? And that exhausted the political capital that was available for that particular operation in Afghanistan, where at the end, if you can't win in a counterterrorism uh, operation, you lose. In a stabilization operation, you neither win nor lose. You are there until you have a slow transformation of the country into a stable democratic structure. So I absolutely agree with you. The end negotiation with the Taliban was done primarily on the on the idea we want to withdraw and we would love not to see our troops killed while we do so. That was the idea of the Oslo Accords. Anything else was blatantly obvious to anyone who wanted to look. So this inter-Afghan dialogue had never a chance. And once the Taliban turned up at 3 a.m. in the morning for the first round of negotiations, so to have started at 9 a.m., it's very clear that what their intention was with the inter-Afghan dialogue. It was bound to fail from the very beginning. But at that time, it was already irreversible. And uh, you know the US would have withdrawn. And the big European problem is that we didn't create a situation where we could have stayed without the US being there. There were 13,000 other troops and 2,500 American troops who provided logistics for everyone else, which means once the Americans are gone, the Germans need to go, the Brits need to go, the French need to go, the Italians need to go, the Spanish need to go. Everyone needs to go because you can't supply your troop with fuel, with ammunition, with food, with anything they need, unless you have the American airplanes. And so we should have, about 10 years ago, made sure that we have our own supply systems. And we didn't. It was cheaper to use the Americans. And then that means American foreign policy, whatever you know, good or bad or helpful or unhelpful it is, in this particular point becomes your foreign policy. You don't have an independent position in Afghanistan if you don't have the means to have an independent position on Afghanistan. And we are where we are, back to the future. Um, I'm going to agree with one thing, and my students like when I comment, so I'm just going to go for it. Yep. Um, so I'm going to agree with, if it was about stabilization, we would have put a lot of more, more money into social society actors and NGOs instead of bu money building weapons. The, no, money no was but never they issue put so much, let's, not, let's be clear about yep. it. Because of the Counterterrorism Act, they did buy lots of tanks, they put lots of money into yep. military uh, operations. We had long time, we can't say, oh, another 10 years would have been better. No, we would have like those those better, aims were not be human for the rights. Afghan people, if we're still there. The, well, I, let's 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 let, yeah, but that's how 20 years were like used for shit, 
and used mainly for like military and so on for like big bucks being made uh, for weapons exporters. And number two, um, I agree about the extradition, but then we also have to attack America because who is extraditing Dick Cheney for the war crimes he did, <laughs> right? Um, so let's I would see actually, a difference between actually Dick you, Cheney you inspired me a lot. I'm thinking of opening up a counter American terrorism <laughs> think tank. Uh, think I think tank there are many organizations who do that already. Because I feel it should be called counter American terrorism think tank. <laughs> because, like, as you see, we have like lots yeah. of people from all over the world, and I see at the UN and so on. The, the movement is shifting, right? The South, America, uh, South African president told uh, Blinken, uh, Link, Blinken, we are not going to be bullied by you anymore. So yeah. uh, just to like put it, to put some balance on yeah. it. But now I'm going to have a lovely student ask you a, form a, a further question. Hello. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a question uh, because the title, even though um, Rosie gave you yeah. the title <laughs> and you kind of separated, but but the title is about Lebanon, yeah. right? And, and stability in the Middle yeah. East. Okay. So my question is, uh, given the fact that usually you need to, everything is in, interconnected in geopolitics. And, and uh, in Lebanon, uh, there are 500, about half a million um, Palestinian um, refugees. And further after the, the American um, regime change war in uh, Syria. Mm. There are additional 300 about uh, refugees from Palestine in Lebanon. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering why did you surgically remove completely the Palestine Israeli conflict because I've been asked to talk about from your presentation? Because I've been asked to talk about Hezbollah. I mean, that's pretty much the only explanation. Yes, but, but, but Hezbollah <laughs> is connected, everything is connected. Yeah, everything is connected to everything else, but I mean, uh, if you focus on Hezbollah, Hezbollah's last interest is to do anything for the Palestinians. They didn't protect Shatta and Shatila when the Americans went in, when the Israelis went in there. So I do not see a Hezbollah interest in anything except misusing this conflict between Israelis and Palestinians, as, by the way, I don't see any interest in most Arab countries to resolve that conflict. Otherwise, you wouldn't have but the Ab Abram Accord. So, so the Palestinians are truly on their own in this one. Hezbollah is not going to help them. This is not in their interest okay, to help. But them. would you think that resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict it would bring a Hezbollah. lot more peace and maybe... Uh, Hezbollah wouldn't change a bit. This is not their issue. They're talking about the southern border of Lebanon. They're talking about Israel being their mortal enemy. <laughs> If the Palestinians would get a state and Israel would continue to exist as a you know, two-state solution, nothing would change with Hezbollah. The Palestinians are simply not the issue that Hezbollah is in the core about. Same thing for, the Iran, for Iran. It's not about the, the Palestinians, it's about their competition with Israel. This wouldn't change. For the Palestinians, it would be better, right, if the Palestinian-Israeli conflict would be resolved. But as you can see with the Abraham Accords, even for most of the Arab world, it's no longer the issue that they actually care about. I would argue there's a long time that they haven't cared about the Palestinians. Uh, otherwise, it, things would have gone very, very differently. And so what you see right now is not only the expression of an extremely right-wing government in Israel, but also an expression of the fact that the Palestinians have no options. They were in the same situation in the 1970s when the PLO started to have their, their uh, uh, attacks against Israeli targets around the world because they had no more political support. How would you get yourself on the agenda if there's Iran, there's Abraham Accords, there's you know, Israeli foreign minister in the UAE? How, what else can the Palestinians do except trying to resist against with violence with the Israelis. That's the price you pay if you normalize the relationship with everyone else and you realize that no one, including Hezbollah, is really taking on your issue anymore. They don't have a patron anymore. So the only unfortunate choice for the Palestinians is armed resistance against, to get back on the agenda, to find someone to take up their cause. Hezbollah certainly is not their cause. They don't care. Okay, morning. I am Chekura Ndau. I come from Mali. Mm. <laughs> All right, so you know what I'm talking about. So, north or south? 
<laughs> okay. Thank you. Where in Mali? Mali, I live in Bamako. In Bamako? Yeah, but I born in the center in Mopti. Okay. So I'm working in UN National yeah. Mission in Mali since eight years. Yeah. So uh, the problem that you are talking, yeah. I know this situation better than most of yours yeah. here. So I has a worker in UN peacekeeping making. I make some patrol me eight years with UN peacekeepers in the north of Mali yep. to make uh, uh, surveillance or yep. discuss with a terrorist group. I know the situation. Now, I'm not talking with as a UN worker, yep. but the UN mission will done in few months in Mali. So I will talk with, as a Malian now. The situation of Mali that you present, for me, I will make a little a cartography of the situation. But unfortunately, I'm not uh, fluent in English, but I will try to defend yeah. my idea. So for me, the situation begin with Libya. When they killed uh, Gaddafi during this fight, Gaddafi came in Mali to to Tuareg's men to help him to fight against OTAN. So when Gaddafi, when they killed Gaddafi, the Tuareg guys bring their arm in Mali with the complicity of some West countries to try to have their own independence in the north of Mali, that Kidal, Tombouctou, Gao, which region are rich in resources like gold, other things. And they fight against Malian government to have their own independence in this north that they call Azawad. And uh, during 10 years, UN mission tried to make a stabilization between Malian government and these two groups. And when France intervention, Serval, Barkan came to stop the terrorist uh, group, which MLLA, the, the Tuareg group, they call friends uh, around the world, Liban, Pakistan, other areas, to help there to have their independence in this part of Mali. So that's very very strategic thing. I, I wanna not to to talk more. So <laughs> it is if you want we can make face and face discussion. Yeah. To no but I have a couple of points. I mean yeah, first of all I would argue the Tuareg had been I have been the evil one. Wait, I'm going to collect uh, two more questions okay. and quick questions because you have to go. Oh, God, uh, is it so, so I have to, yeah, so you are going to have your last okay. word. So two quick questions. I'm s very yeah. sorry. Um, okay, sweep, but oh, under a minute, all of you. Okay. Sure, all right. Uh, up. Okay, good, perfect. Yeah, pick and choose what you can answer then. <laughs> all right, thank you, sir. My name is Glab. Uh, and my question is about the level of retaliation to certain groups. So we have Hezbollah, uh, we have, let's say, Boko Haram, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and others which are considered to be a te uh, terrorist organizations by the U.S. and, well, many other countries. A and the U.N. And the U.N., yeah. Which uh, is the world. Let's say Russia, for example, doesn't <laughs> consider Hezbollah as a terrorist state, but yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is uh, about the level of retaliation mm -hmm. and uh, how is it managed. So, for example, we see in the case of ISIS, everyone, yeah, everyone... Uh, well, the, the level of retaliation was really harsh, right? It was bombing, it was um, all kind of, well, things, right? I would right? argue which is the Islamic State has already been quite harsh. I, I, I suppose, <laughs> which is fair, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but how is it 
uh, chosen the level of retaliation? Is it uh, chosen by, let's say, int intelligence of the group, let's say, like Hezbollah in comparison to ISIS, or yeah. is it managed some somehow else? Yep. Uh, thank you. Mine is connected to the question from my brother from Mali. Mm -hmm. I want to take you to the DRC and I'll focus mm -hmm. on stabilization that you said. Yeah. If you go to the DRC, daytime, the rebels are drinking with you in a peacekeeping yes. uh, team. In the night, they go to fight. There is a lot of food rations in DRC supplied by people that I don't know. Yeah. The military fatigue supplied by people I don't know. Yeah. Land cruisers supplied by Toyota. I mean, you do know who supplies and, and, the arms to the uh, no, 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 I mean, no. if you're from the DRC, you can do I, know. Can it's I it's all your kind neighbors around you. Yes, you of course. So I'm saying, <laughs> do you think the war in the DRC mm. is not ending because there are a lot of entities that are benefiting from the war, that are making people fight just because big wasting companies that make armory, big companies that provide food and military wear, mm. are there in the DRC? Well, I would say your neighbors have a good problem. One more, more. I guess the four questions. Okay, this is getting lots, yes. Mine is, mine is very short. I'm yeah. Audrey from Ireland, and thank you for your presentation. Um, it's just, I see the Wagner Group mentioned, yeah. and I just wanted to know what your views were on the current situation now that right. um, Precaution has moved to Belarus, and what scenarios yeah. you see playing out, possibly. Thank you. Okay. okay, so now you have the hard task. Yeah, I, I, I love the focus on Lebanon. Um, <laughs> first of all, Mali. I would argue that the Tuareg had long been recruited before the 2011. And, and you know that, if you're honest. So the problem was not the recruitment of the Tuareg to fight the, 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 the opposition forces in, Lebanon, uh, in Libya, but uh, the outflow of the Tuareg after the fight was over. Uh, MINUSMA was indeed set up to bring a peaceful resolution to the very legitimate demands of the Tuareg for some kind of an autonomy in the north of the country. It was not set up to fight the Tuareg. Uh, it was not set up to discipline the Tuareg. It was set up to actually facilitate peace negotiations. Read the mandate. So, you know, it is the only place and the only organization that actually worked for peace in Mali. Um, it's withdrawal now towards the end of the year, which means, you know, the coup government asked the international community to abandon the country. If you think the situation is going to be better after MINUSMA has withdrawn in Mali, I'm very sorry, but you've been prone, you've been falling victim to a lot of Russian disinformation who very much try to make sure that MINUSMA is seen in the most negative light uh, uh, possible. I've been talking to the Malian government a couple of weeks ago in New York in the framework of the negotiations of the of the uh, government, and they indeed want to have a dialogue with Al Qaeda and the Islamic State. Um, my counter argument is: if you have nothing to give, that dialogue means a handover negotiations. How well that has worked out, ask your colleague from Afghanistan. Um, in addition. The successive governments, and that's not just this particular coup government, but also the predecessor governments, treated MINUSMA and the European support pretty much as an ATM. I do vividly remember an order of 100,000 bulletproof socks that were built to the European Union at 100 euros per pair of socks by the Malian army. Uh, spoiler alert, there are no bulletproof socks, and there are no socks that... Yeah. And there are no bulletproof socks that cost 100 euros. It was simply a redistribution mechanism where one general wanted to have a bigger cut of the military budget and therefore bill it to the European Union. So the problem in Mali is influenced by external factors, but is to such an extent homegrown a Malian problem of the way the successive governments have acted in the last 30 years that, yes, a couple more weapons and a couple of Tuareg coming out of Libya may have been the drop that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we, as we always say in Germany, the drop that brings this fast zum Überlaufen, the last straw. But you don't have a last straw if you don't have a massive amount of straws beforehand. So, yes, it exacerbated the situation, but the situation wasn't great in Mali and as far as the Tuareg is concerned until 2011 either. Um, what retaliation is concerned, the threat uh, and the response to the Islamic State was simply an, an effect of the Islamic State actually having a global agenda, right? And so 
the military operations against the Islamic State didn't ramp up until we had the first major terrorist attacks in our country. The problem that I see here is, right, and I can only explain this with a more than, you know, I wouldn't even call it benevolent, but it's just a massive disinterest. There is more territory under control of the Islamic State now here with just about as many resources as in Iraq than it was in Iraq, but we are still having these comfort narratives that we are talking about indigenous insurgencies um, who may ascribe to a global ideology and are globally networked. I mean, I can follow and we'll watch the social media output for the Islamic State worldwide. I can see the Islamic State fighters in Afghanistan uh, discussing in detail the situation in West Africa. So whoever is under the impression that this is just a home con conflict, and as soon as they have established full control, they would not in a heartbeat turning around and trying to attack Europe and America again is very, very sadly mistaken. The problem with the DRC is that you do have too many, too many resources, and you have too many neighbors with too many interests. Yes, there are some Western countries. Yes, their track record is not perfect. But I'm sorry, they didn't send the groups from the neighboring states trying to get control of the very same resources. They also didn't ask any number of military companies uh, you know, and pay them in the natural resources. That is also a DRC problem. So Wagner. Um, the problem is when you create something that is illegal from the very beginning and then you lose control over it. That's exactly what happened in Russia. Wagner was a very, very convenient tool. And by the way, there is a clear law in the, in, in the Russian Federation that says it's illegal to operate a military, private military company. There is no way that you could have something like Wagner uh, in, in, in the legal framework that the Russian Federation itself has had. But Wagner was a very convenient tool for the Russian government to do foreign policy, including quite violent foreign policy in places where it didn't want to send their own troops or didn't, didn't want to admit that it had any interest. That includes the DRC, that includes uh, uh, Mali, that includes uh, Burkina Faso, and that includes also Syria. It is much better if Wagner does the massacre than if the Russian military does the massacre, right? And so Wagner was created as a foreign uh, policy instrument, uh, the controlling aspect of that was that it was indeed illegal to exist in Russia, which means Prigozhin always was one foot in the prison and one foot out of the prison. The problem changed with Ukraine. Once Russia invaded, by the way, for the second time Ukraine since 2014, Wagner became an indispensable part of the Russian military machinery, which meant it became much more weapons, much heavier weapons than it had before. And it re, you know, it became a actual power player within the Russian system, which it hadn't been before. Prigozhin was an important tool, but he was not a power player. With Ukraine, he became actually a power player. And then when Shoigu and the military establishment try to rein in in this, Wagner is just one. There's Rusic, there's the Gazprom PMCs who operate in Ukraine. There's a lot of actual neo-Nazi groups, Russian neo-Nazi groups, like the Russian Pearl Movement, operating on the Russian side of the front in Ukraine. Once Shoigu and the uh, military, uh, the, the defense ministry, tried to regain control over these because, because they became too independent, it worked with all but Wagner. Prigozhin was not willing to sign that contract. And that's why the march to Moscow. And that's why the turnaround, uh, uh, because he was offered that Wagner could continue to exist, not in Russia, but in Belarus. So that's why, best case here, we'll not see any changes of our Wagner operations here. They will still continue to operate. They're still going to get paid in gold here, or in gold in Sudan, where they also operate in uh, um, uh, in support of the rapid response forces in Sudan at this particular point, or in the DRC. Because here Wagner is very, very useful. They, but however, they will be removed from the imme immediate power circle within Russia and now extradited to Belarus. How risky that is, you can see on the reaction of the Polish government, right? who also can look at the map and realizes that something called Kaliningrad which is completely surrounded by, by Polish territory, right? And the next argument after Ukraine, very conceivably, will be we need a corridor between Kaliningrad and Belarusian Russian territory. And who better to use than the one force that is well-armed, well-trained, battle-hardened, but not the Russian military to achieve that corridor. So we are in a bit of a bind here. No one exactly knows what the deal is, but relocating to Belarusia 
has a whole set of additional problems because it opens up new possibilities for the Russian uh, Federation to divert resources and attentions away from our support for Ukraine into defensive uh, uh, operations that we need to possibly organize now along the Polish border in order to prevent this from becoming a secondary uh, uh, concern as far as military operations is concerned, which is exactly what the Russians would need. So there is an argument this was all a big theater because not really any resistance was shown against Wagner on its way to, to Russia, which is very odd. Usually when people resist Putin, they fall out of windows, get poisons in, uh, in, in uh, 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 English parks or shot in the Tiergarten here. And this seemed to have been amicably resolved within 48 hours. That's not usually how the Russian government acts in these situations. So, you know, we, we may actually have the beginning of a completely new set of hybrid warfare by the Russians. So, thank you very much for your open words. You can, while he's going, you can do it because we, we he really needs to go. I, we took 15 minutes more. So, uh, talk to him in private. Um, we are going to have hopefully some snacks since I'm sitting here. I don't know. Um, but there should have been some snacks coming. Are we having snacks? Anyway, we are going to take a break until 12.30, so 15 minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much.